So today I'm very excited to talk about a revolutionary thinker, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. If I were to say that Rousseau is one of the uh, most influential thinkers that shape and form the French Revolution, that would not be incorrect. Um, the style of Rousseau's writing is extremely exciting, a lot of fun. And you know, so he writes these short aphorisms that are really very powerful. For example, I prefer liberty with danger than peace with slavery, and many such other interesting sort of phrases. Rousseau was from a Calvinist family in Geneva, which converted to Catholicism. He was born in 1712 and died in 1778. Uh, so he died just before the French Revolution, a decade before it. He tried to succeed at first as a musician and a composer, but that wasn't very successful. In 1740, he met Denis Diderot and Jean de Albert, uh, both of whom had a very important uh, impact on Rousseau and vice versa. These were the compilers of the new encyclopedia. Um, and uh, the, the encyclopedia is also very interesting because uh, the encyclopedia was th first thought of as a way to redefine all knowledge, but redefine it in a secular way, in a scientific and rational way, in the spirit of science, rationalism, and secularism. So before that, of course, European knowledge was uh, very much dominated by the religious scholastic tradition. And the encyclopedia was the first major attempt to recreate all of that in light of rationalism. So um, his books were often banned in Switzerland and France. Arrest warrants were issued for him, etc. He also went to England where he met David Hume and characteristically of Rousseau had a big fight with him and uh, then came back. Um, he was a relatively speaking, uh, you know, he, he, he was uh, uh, sometimes difficult to get along with. Um, so his key works include Discourses, Discourse on the Sciences and Arts in 1750, Discourse on the Origin and Foundation of Inequality Amongst Men, and in 1755, Discourse on Political Economy, 1762, The Social Contract. Of course, the social contract is uh, what we are going to focus on today, mainly because that uh, is, becomes the foundation of modern democratic states. So um, he is the product, really, of the mid to late 18th century, what we call the period of enlightenment. He captures that quite well, I think, although there is a strand in him that is also very strongly influencing the romantic tradition. But mainly, he is a philosopher of the Enlightenment. He had radically different views of the state of nature, uh, as opposed to certainly Hobbes. He had a view of the state of nature, which was totally different. He thought, uh, I'll, uh, when we go into it, I'll, sh I'll show you, he thought that man in the state of nature was innocent, really. And uh, his thought can also be considered, although he's on the one hand a product of the Enlightenment, the romantic aspects of his thought can also be considered uh, part of counter-Enlightenment thinking. Specifically, his work called Discourse on the Sciences and Arts uh, that held the view that science can corrupt and erode morals. It can decrease human virtue and happiness, and it does not lead to improving lives, but leads to the destruction of our natural selves in the name of science. Um, the march of civilization, Rousseau thought, uh, famously argued, and this is a very important argument, um, including the development of science and the art, has not developed mankind, but rather has corrupted him. Now you might think, sir, this makes no sense to us. I mean, long time ago when we were living in the caves, man was very cruel, man was very barbaric, man was horrible. If a man wanted, you know, to be with a woman, he would drag him off drag her off by, by her hair into his cave or something. And uh, whoever wanted could club each other and kill each other. And since then, we've come a long way. Now we have constitutions, and we have democracy, and we have kingdoms, and we have states, and we have culture, and we have art, and we have music, and poetry, and literature, and all of these things. Why then do you think, why, Mr. Russo, do you think civilization has corrupted people, and so on? Um, well. 
to answer that question, let me play for you a music video that um, I really loved when I was a kid, and especially when I was in school. Um, this music video is, was uh, uh, released in the 1970s by a band called Pink Floyd. Anybody heard of it? Almost everybody's heard of it. Awesome. And uh, the music video, I think, should resonate with many of you because it challenges our notions of what education is really all about. In the view of Pink Floyd and Roger Waters specifically, education isn't really about education. It's really about institutionalization. So.
you wish. <laughs> so, um, Rousseau, I mean, this, uh, this music video, I, I don't know how many of you had seen this before today. Okay, so for most of you it was new. So this is very much a music video in line with what Rousseau thinks about education. He, when he writes on education, he thinks that education is responsible for corrupting the state of nature and perpetuating the evils of modern society. He thinks that reason, the way in which we think today in the modern world, threatens human innocence, freedom and happiness. Instead of education of the intellect, he pr proposes education of the senses by uh, uh, opening yourself up to art and literature and music, opening up to developing your senses. He thinks that maybe we could become more sensitive people, We'd be, we could become more humane people. Um, so he thinks that conventional religion as well as atheism has ha have had in this essay adverse effects. Religious uh, faith should also be guided by the heart not by the head, not by reason. That's very Sufiistic if you think about it, uh, and so on. So Rousseau thinks that in the state of nature, if you leave man to his normal condition, life would not be terrible at all. In fact, the state of nature is pastoral idyll, where people are fundamentally good. In other words, people are not killing each other, people are not slaughtering each other. In fact, quite the opposite, they live in harmony and in innocence with each other. People have innate virtue, they have innate compassion, they have innate empathy. Misal ke taur pe jab aap kahin ja rahe hote hain aur aap dekhte hain koi billi hai aur usko chot lagi hui hai to you always feel bad for that. Ab aapka billi se kya taluq? Agar insaan kahin gira pada ho to you can't help but feel bad about that, right? If you look at some pictures ke Ethiopia mein bachche is tarah staff kar rahe hain ya wo Syrian bachcha jo hai Turkey ke beech pe is tarah mara pada nikla hai so you can't help but feel that this is a big problem. Although you don't know that child. Um, or if you look at what's happening in Kashmir. How many of you have been to Kashmir? Okay, that's quite a bit. Um, uh, but even the people who have not been to Kashmir will feel some sense of empathy if you hear that people in Kashmir are being shot in the face with pellet guns and so on and so forth. Or, uh, Palestine for example people feel a natural affinity maybe you think that's because of religion but you think uh, you look at any human picture any child you will not ask what religion that child has you will feel if that child is suffering you will feel that within you so that is innate in humanity um, the state this state of innocence is disrupted by what the power of reason which separates humankind from the rest of nature it detaches us from our natural virtue he says the imposition of civil society is a move away from virtue to vice from idyllic happiness to misery this fall is regrettable uh, but also he says inevitable so he thinks if you if you look at uh, the uh, narrative in the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, the narrative in religion, in our religion, is that in the Garden of Eden, man was innocent, uh, did not have any knowledge, uh, and did not commit any evil acts. And it's only when man plucks from the tree of knowledge, from where? The tree of knowledge, the forbidden fruit, and eats it, when Adam eats the forbidden fruit, that Adam falls he suddenly becomes aware, and Eve too, they suddenly become aware not of their innocence but of their nakedness. They become aware of sin. And that is when they are cast out from the Garden of Eden. And what is their punishment? That they must labor in order to live. That is their punishment. And that is the condition now of mankind, that we must labor in order to live. This is all stated very explicitly in the Bible, correct? And also, of course, in the Quran and Majid. So, Rousseau is constructing a similar idea except it's not a religious one he thinks that man in its in his original form or by man he means man men and women was was innocent was was an innocent person had no knowledge of how to do evil things and so on and so forth but as his knowledge developed he could then now also use that scientific knowledge to dominate over nature and to dominate over other men and other and women etc and use that knowledge not uh, uh, you know, not to live together with nature, together with fellow man, but in fact to oppress nature as well as to oppress man.
The process, he says, began by the introduction of private property. Obviously, they, if you go back far back enough in time, you will come to a time where man lived in a condition which was uh, where there was no state, where there was no economy in the modern sense, there was no money in the modern sense, etc. If you go back to the time, you will get a time when you live in the jungle. And if you live in the jungle, you can imagine that there was no state of the jungle. Malkiyat ka tasawar nahi tha. Everything was shared in common. The fruit of the forest was shared in common. The fruit of the land, the nature was there in common. Anybody could go to a well and drink the water from the well or pluck fruits from the trees or, you know, uh, live off the land in any way that they please because it didn't belong to anybody. It just belonged to, it was part of nature. So you could appropriate from nature whatever you wanted. But at some point, man began to demarcate and say, no. This is my land, it's not your land. This is my tree, this is my stream, it doesn't belong to you. And so begins private property. And when private property begins, we get greed and we get um, avarice and we get uh, man working against men. The society formed could only be maintained by a system of laws now. Laws come about as a consequence of private property. If you think about Marx's view of uh, how the juridical system comes about, you see that in fact it's very similar to the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Marx, I think, takes from Rousseau's, many of Rousseau's ideas. As, and greatly admired Rousseau at one level as well, to be honest. So, uh, as natural values lost, laws characterized by selfishness, not justice. Laws were designed to protect property. In, they were inflicted on the poor by the rich. So, when, wh how did the first laws come about? How did the judicial system come about? It didn't come about, as John Locke says, that we state of nature, mein, we couldn't be a judge in our own case, so we decided, oh, neutral judge, bana dete, etc., etc., and all of this was accomplished by some sort of consent. That's rubbish. That's not how history really worked. In fact, what happened is that tribes that were powerful, uh, they made their tribes ko apni property. Bana liya. Dusre logon ko apni property. Banaya. Khawateen ko apni property. Banaya. One of the first forms of property are slaves and women, women and slaves. They enslaved other people. They made land their private property. And then they created laws to protect that property. Laws were first created to protect slavery, to protect my land from somebody else taking it away from me. And not everybody had that land. Not everybody had slave, uh, slaves, etc. Obviously, if there are slave owners, then there are many people who are slaves. So the law was meant to protect the slave owner, the property of the, of the rich and powerful. The law was never there to protect the poor. This is very recently, okay, now we claim, okay, oh, the law is also there to protect the poor. But if you really study the law, you discover that its origins begin with the protection of property. Even Locke admits it. He says the whole function of the state is to protect property. Well, not everybody has property. People are property. How does Locke ignore that fact? Actually, he doesn't, but he some, at some point even justifies it. So the move from a natural to a civilized state therefore brought about a move not only from virtue to vice, from innocence and freedom to injustice and enslavement. Although humanity is naturally virtuous, it is corrupted by society. And although man is born free, the laws imposed by society condemn him to a life in chains. So Rousseau begins his famous book by saying, um, Man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains. So in the history of humanity, humanity came into this earth that we know of and there was no property, they, man was born free. But through the march of civilization, we have now enslaved them. And if you look at the march of civilization, is it anything but the progressive enslavement of people? You look at uh, the aborigines of Australia, or the aborigines of Africa or whatever, they may not have a lot, I, I concede to you, okay, they live very simple lives. They don't have any computers and technology, etc., etc. But nobody else is able to oppress them. They are totally free. They are not slaves of anybody else. They do as they please. They work in their families and so on. They, the only difficult conditions they face are with respect to nature. But um, even there as hunter-gatherers, they, they are not enslaved by anyone. And then we see that when civilization marches, the first great states that are created, Babylon, 
Egypt, Greece, Persia, all of them are based on slavery. When we look at what happens in the Indus Valley civilization, if we believe the Aryan immigration theory, the Aryans come down from the north, etc., and from the west, come and conquer the Dravidians of, Indi of uh, uh, the Indus Valley civilization, either displace them towards South India or conquer them, and now call them Dasu or Dasa, uh, you know, basically, which means servant or slave. Uh, and create a whole caste system, a whole hierarchy in which people who are of the lower caste are essentially, basically slaves of people who are in the upper castes, right? So we see the same process in China, in Mongolia, everywhere you look at history, history is so full of blood and violence and gore that it is absolutely incredible. If you read, after you read history, you become, I, when I read history after that, I become very cynical because uh, all I see is People conquering other people, people enslaving other people. The whole history of civilization, as Rousseau would put it, is a history really of one tribe taking another's slaves. So this is a very pessimistic analysis of modern society. Modern society is full of inequalities, injustices. Um, and of course, in 1750 in France, uh, the, you know, where um, uh, there was a great divide between the rich and the poor, and the aristocracy lived, you know, really flamboyant and really sort of extravagant lives. And because the French had also um, uh, subsidized and uh, supported and financially, uh, you know, financially supported the American Revolution, that in turn also caused France to experience greater poverty, rising cost of living, and so on. So Rousseau's theory in the context of the mid 18th century France are like a powder keg. Uh, you know, they, they really ignite the powder that already exists in France. And second discourse calls for going back to nature, for example. Um, it contains the seeds of the next great movement, which was the Romantic movement. The Romantic <coughs> movement is an idea in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the arts that uh, we have separated ourselves from nature and that we must go back to nature. Consider, for example, that you are sitting here in the morning, you are sitting here and you are sitting in a in a camera which is totally closed, where you have no kind of natural air. You have no kind of natural light. If you have a light, then you have artificial neon light. And it is also very low because I have put a projector in front of the light and I have closed it so that you can see what is written on the projector. This is a dark, depressing environment. You people should be out in the sunlight. You people should spend your days in the sun. The human being is not able to sit in the camera उसकी बॉडी बनाई नहीं गई थी आपकी नेचुरल बॉडी जो है इट डिजायर्स सनलाइट आपको पता है अगर आपको सनलाइट ना मिले तो विटामिन डी नहीं प्रोड्यूस होती विटामिन डी जो है वो कैल्शियम के अंदर चेंज नहीं होती कैल्शियम ना प्रोड्यूस होए तो हड्डियां कमजोर हो जाती अगर एक बच्चे को बंद कमरे के अंदर बंद कर दिया जाए और उसको कोई सूरज की रोशनी ना मिले तो उसकी हड्डियां ही नहीं डेवलप होती दैट्स हाउ मच वी नीड सनलाइट एंड आल्सो इफ यू मिस द सनलाइट योर होल मेलेटोनिन साइकिल द होल साइकिल ऑफ योर स्लीप एंड वेकिंग अप एटसेट्रा यू नो दैट गेट्स डिस्टर्ब and uh, you become depressed, you become unhappy, you become sad. If you don't get enough sunlight, why do you think the British people are always in such a bad mood? Why do the British people never talk to each other in a nice way? They're all like stiff upper lip and all. Because they don't get a lot of sunlight. Well, that's one theory. Well, at least when they get sunlight, they get really happy and they come out and they're like, hey, it's a beautiful day. But if they don't get any sunlight, they're like, it's terrible. So uh, that was a joke, by the way. Of course, the, <laughs> the culture of the British people uh, has, a, you know, has a, to do with a lot more than just sunlight. But certainly, on a nice, bright, sunny day, people cheer up. On a gloomy day, people will not cheer up. And as I said in the last class to you, if you are awake till 4 a.m. in the morning, and then you sleep till 3 p.m. in the afternoon, you are bound bound to get unhappy and depressed because through the day you are only getting maybe two hours of sunlight, two and a half hours of sunlight, whereas what you really need is a solid eight hours of natural sunlight in order to, in order for your body and your mind, your brain to function well, you need eight hours, of, minimum eight hours of sunlight. So, um, 
So uh, the, uh, the, to the problems of modern life, um, sorry, uh, let me backtrack here a little bit. So the opening sentence of his book is, man is born free, yet everywhere he is in chains. And this was adopted as a slogan of the French Revolution, which occurred 27 years later. It, the leading uh, slogan of the French Revolution was liberty, equality, fraternity. Fraternity means, of course, brotherhood, that society should live as, 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 as brothers and not against each other. Um, the social contract offers an alternative to civil society, which is, would be run by all citizens who legislate. This would not be a monarchy. This would not be a church. This would not be a society run by the aristocracy. It would be a society run by people, by all of you. Um, it is based on classical republican democracy, a citizen's body, a unit prescribing laws according to the general will. What is this general will? It is not the will of generals. General Sahib, what is will? It is the will of the people. Everyone would be equal in the eyes of the law with freedom to partake in, legislative, in the legislative process. We would have the elimination of inequality. We would have the elimination of injustice. We would have a feeling of fraternity, of belonging to society. Tell me you don't want this feeling of belonging to society. Tell me you don't want the elimination of inequality and injustice. Who can deny the power of Rousseau's argument? His influence is vast. Uh, he also has a, not just has a large following, but also great notoriety. Uh, his ideas offered revolutionaries of its time a viable alternative to a system that they perceived to be corrupt. His philosophy was obviously in complete contradiction with the uh, contemporary thinking of his time. He fell out, or even with his fellow reformers, such as Voltaire and David Hume, as I told you, he was a real radical of his time. Hegel also integrated Rousseau's idea of social contract into his philosophy. And as I told you already, so did Marx and Engels. Um, 11 years after the death of Rousseau, the French Revolution occurred, which was inspired by Rousseau's notion that um, it is unjust for a few rich people to rule over voiceless, powerful, powerless people. Robespierre appropriated Rousseau's philosophy for his own ends during the reign of terror. Robespierre and Saint Just were the leaders of the French Revolution, uh, and of course, they were also the you know, they were extreme revolutionists who wanted to completely do away with all vestiges of feudalism uh, in France. Now, this is the great, the French Revolution, of course, is the great bourgeois democratic revolution, to use a Marxist phrase. It is the great democratic revolution, to use a more liberal phrase. It's the model on which oh, everybody has based themselves and has had a huge influence on political science. Whenever we look at Pakistan and we say, oh my God, we have to military dictatorship, we are really thinking on the lines of the French Revolution when we say we need a democratic revolution in Pakistan, we need to storm the Bastille and so on and so forth. So the French Revolution was characterized by two main thrusts. Ke they wanted to get rid of the monarchy. They no longer wanted to be ruled by a king. They said, Badshah baut ho gaya, Badshah baut ho gai, ye mamla khatam kiya jai, aur awam jo hai, jis tarah Nawaz Sharif ne kaita, kya kaita hai, vote ko izzat do. Thik hai? To French revolutionaries bhi ye kaya rahe thai, ke awam ko izzat do. Ke us samane mein abhi voting ka tasawar to us tarah se nahi develop hua tha, jis tarah se aaj hai, ke har bandha aur har aurat bhi vote kare gi. तो ऐसे तो नहीं था, but they still thought कि भई आवाम की हुकूमत होनी चाहिए, आवाम की मंशा, आवाम की जो राय है, उस पर हुकूमत जो है वो बुनियाद रखे। इसी तरह 1791 में थॉमस पेन का आर्टिकल, the rights of man argued that government's only purpose is to safeguard the rights of the individual. And Marx finally also understood, developed, and adopted Rousseau's analysis of capitalist society and the revolutionary means of changing it. In 1848, Marx and Engels published the Communist Manifesto that encouraged the proletarians of the world to rise up and defeat the bourgeois or the capitalists of the world. They said, proletarians of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your change. The Romantic movement was also influenced by Rousseau's thought, um, and they thought that uh, art and literature and poetry, artists, 
कि दे डोंट व्हेन यू सी एन आर्टिस्ट यू सी दैट आर्टिस्ट विल लव टू वॉक अराउंड बेह फुट बाल भी थोड़े वाइल्ड मैन किस्म के बाल होते हैं लंबे लंबे बाल होते हैं उनके वगैरह वगैरह ऐसे होते हैं ना आर्टिस्ट म्यूजिशंस एंड आर्टिस्ट एंड सोन बिकॉज इज बिकॉज ऑफ द इनोमस इन्फ्लुंस ऑफ द रोमांटिक मूवमेंट ऑन ऑल द आर्ट्स द आइडिया दैट यू कैन नॉट really produce good art until you are in touch with nature and until you are in touch with your own nature so the whole emphasis of uh, of the arts under the influence of the romantic movement is to be in touch with yourself to be in touch with your own feelings so right so um john rolls also is influenced by jean jacques rousseau so as you can see his intellectual and political influence is absolutely vast unprecedented 